Okay, it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, today uh, Professor Berger, Mitch Berger from Exeter University, who will uh, give us a talk on magnetic helicity and decompositions and methods of localization. To you, Mitch. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me and, and, and joining the, the conference here. Um, and good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so, I mean, classically topology discusses complete global objects. Um, if you have circles or, or close uh, curves, they're, they're supposed to be closed and then they link or, or they not. But, and geometry might look more closely at different parts of the object. So, what we're trying to do today is, is get some links between geometry and topology. How do you get to the topology knowing some aspects of the geometry? Um, so um, Euclidean metric throughout, we need a Euclidean metric in order to figure out what's happening locally to do uh, the geometry. Uh, so I'll first talk about linking versus winding. And in, in a way, taking leaking numbers, um, you can, instead of having that as a three-dimensional integral, we can sort of see it one plane at a time, or maybe eventually one sphere at a time for concentric spheres. I will digress a bit on higher order winding, since I have this winding and it's sort of this be in my bonnet for a long time that such a thing must exist. Um, then I'll, uh, instead of dividing up space into parallel planes, I'll go into poloidal toroidal decompositions where you do something like concentric spheres and try to generalize the poloidal toroidal formulas where uh, you don't have symmetric spheres, just nested simply connected surfaces. And that uh, will be another way of decomposing the winding that goes into uh, the linking of curves and linking of fields, especially. I'll then do a short amount of time in Fourier spectra and show uh, possibly an artificial example where Fourier spectra are not seeing what you want to see, and then go to wavelets, which may well um, uh, step in where Fourier spectra are not working um, and spend a bit of time on, on the wavelet stuff. So first of all, go to something, um, let's see. There. So, um, yeah. So everybody knows the Gauss linking number and uh, it was Keith who said, hey, look at this Gauss linking integral. Let's just sort of fatten up slightly these um, tangent vectors into uh, field lines and, and throw in some magnetic flux. And now it's uh, an integral. And this is the way I always like to see magnetic helicity defined rather than integral of a dot b. So it's really showing it in its full glory as a six dimensional integral. Um, and, um, but if you like, you can take that integrand, uh, which is a weird sort of uh, two point correlation function between the field vectors use the bile savar integral, and then that gives you, gets you to this form that, that is maybe more familiar and more easier to use. But I think the original formula, the, the six-dimensional formula, is really where the definition should be. Um, and I, I remember the Okay, so, so to digress, the, the, the problem with A dot B is A isn't gauge invariant. You can add a gauge uh, gradient to it. And for a closed field, the helicity won't matter. Um, so the integrand A dot B 
may not be meaningful. Um, and I remember long ago uh, in the late 80s going to a fusion conference and at least this conference, I don't know in general about fusion conferences, but it was more rowdy than astronomy conferences. People would, would, would actually yell at each other a bit. And we were discussing the gauge non-invariance of A dot B. And I meekly raised my hand and said, well, maybe we should make it that the, the local helicity density really is B dot R, B of X dot R cross B of Y over R squared. Um, two point correlations, local density in six dimensions. And everybody yelled at me, but they were yelling all day, so I didn't take it too badly. Um, but maybe that's one way of thinking. That really is a helicity density in six dimensions. Um, double three dimensional integral. Now, having done that, six is a lot of dimensions, so maybe we can think of it as five dimensional. Um, first of all, the linking number looks like a double integral, as I said. Uh, but if we take a link and try to make it look as much as possible like a braid, then we can look at how the winding behaves as you go from the bottom of the braid to the top of the braid. So you can do it as a single integral of mutual winding. Okay, so each uh, linking integral is, is sort of an integral d by dz of, of um, integral over z of how uh, the winding proceeds as you go up in z. Now the winding itself you're going to need to integrate if, if, if you have a field. Um, so let's say you have two field lines. Um, you have a relative position vector and that rotates as you go up in Z, okay, and um, the double sum over the flux tubes becomes a double integral over the X, Y plane. Um, so you have dH, dZ is this four-dimensional integral over pairs of field lines, and then you get one more integral just to go up in Z. So, so you actually save one dimension by going to winding. It's, it's, um, so that's one way where topology sort of comes down to geometry. Instead of having fully three-dimensional, it's sort of like two plus one dimensional. Um, now we can do this with parallel planes in a little while. I'll do this with concentric spheres and then arbitrary uh, nested um, simply connected surfaces. Um, but for the moment, while I have you there, uh, so, so it's helicity one plane at a time. Um, th th there are a few way equivalent ways of obtaining helicity one at a time. One is relative helicity. The other is the winding gauge, uh, which Pryor and Yates, McTaggart and Pryor, have been using quite a bit. It's this uh, vector potential here, um, which sort of looks like cooling gauge, but it's two-dimensional. And it sort of, uh, again, you can get from it the net winding field line by field, pairs of field lines by pairs of field lines from this uh, winding gauge. So it's sort of a meaningful gauge. It's actually saying something about the geometry. Uh, the third thing is the poloidal toroidal formula, which I'll get to in, in a lot more detail, um, which and some of it gives you the same thing as, as, as the winding gauge. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to give an aside um, because it, I'm talking about linking and helicity for most of the talk, but there are, of course, more elaborate topological invariants, and there is a hierarchy of integral invariants known as 
uh, Chen's iterated integrals, and they have other names as well. And uh, one way of using that is to look at the Borromean rings. So the Borromean rings pairwise are unlinked with the usual linking number, but they are, you can't pull them apart. The pigtail braid that corresponds to it, if you just identify, identify endpoints. Um, well, we're trying, uh, with the braid, you, you get sort of winding rather than linking. So maybe there's a higher order of winding, um, which is associated with these higher order linking numbers that describe Borromean braids. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so there's a way of doing this. Um, so basically, if, if I, I go back up a little bit, if I just take two strings, and as you go up, you take the relative position vector here, that relative position vector rotates as you go upwards, and you keep track of the angle of it and let the angle go more than 2 pi if it goes around more than one turn. Um, okay, so that's um, the winding number between two strings. If you have three strings, you have three pairs, so you'll have three different winding numbers. And as you go up the braid in Z, you could plot these three numbers in a with three axes, okay? And as you go in one axis, it's um, say the yellow and the blue are moving around each other to pi, four pi, or whatever. Um, and same thing with the other two. Um, now, if you rotate all three points in a uniform solid rotation, you're not changing the shape of the triangle. Um, and what happens is you go into the direction one comma one comma one, which would be perpendicular to this sort of weird sort of plane I have here. So the interesting bit is when the shape of the triangle um, relating these three yellow, red, and blue changes as you go upwards. Now you can't, uh, that, that triangle is of course, uh, constrained because the interior angles have to add up to pi. But also, let's say one interior angle is pi upon two. You can share the remaining pi upon two with the other two angles. Um, and uh, you can't just choose them arbitrarily. So what I have here, the yellow, the, sorry, orange regions are acceptable regions that correspond to good triangles, whereas the hexagonal holes correspond to impossible triangles. Okay. Um, so the actual braid, the, the, the uh, path of the braid will be this sort of uh, ring here. As you go upward and said, you move around this ring. A bit of it wiggles in terms of the total rotation of all three, but most of it's due to the change in shape of the triangles. Um, so if I just look at that plane um, and, and ignore uh, solid body rotations, a second, it's going to, oh, here it is in the pigtail, you just get a nice winding around in this weird plane with, with all these hexagonal holes. So you, I guess, I think you can call that a higher order winding. Here's a, another example. Um, the different hexagons correspond to having wound in, in two of the strings having wound through more than two pi. Um, so I, I think an open question is, can you play this game all the way up um, go to third order, fourth order, fifth order winding, always get some picture like this. 
you end up with a plane, you end up with lots of holes in that plane, and you, you, you get some sort of winding angle in that plane. Anyhow, my, I'm, my guess is that you can do this, but, but I'm not sure. Um, so getting back to ordinary linking and helicity, um, first I'll go to the poloidal toroidal formula. Now, these names I, I suppose are, are somewhat different for um, say fusion people who work inside a torus. So this is strictly for working with planes or spheres. Um, and you define a, uh, an operator, differential operator, z hat cross del or r hat cross del. Sometimes it's defined as r vector cross del for planar or spherical geometries. And then you can write the magnetic field in terms of two scalar functions, the toroidal function t and the poloidal function p. And you work out the helicity, you find that it's two integral lt dot lp. So again, you get that as we can write this one plane at a time, and f of z is like the helicity in that plane. It's the net amount that the field lines are angling around each other, winding around each other in that plane. Um, so um, we can write the vector potential in terms of these things. Um, and the Laplacian within the plane, which I'm write, writing as del squared perp p, that gives you the normal bn and the toroidal field. Um, del Recording is t. on. Del, del perp squared t is, is, is jn. So the poloidal field takes care of all of the normal components of, the, of B, the magnetic field. The toroidal field takes care of all of the normal J. So poloidal field is a potential field, in effect. It doesn't have any uh, J normal. And the toroidal field is, toroidal magnetic field has no magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. It's, it's closed curves within the plane. One way to write things is dhdz. If you, if you disintegrate by parts, it's uh, integral of scalar t times bz. Try to make some pictures of, of this. So the back lt dot lp, so that's like um, the uh, lt is the toroidal magnetic field. LP is the vector potential for the toroidal, for the poloidal field. So it's the linking of the toroidal and poloidal field lines, and that's sort of what I've drawn here. Okay, poloidal flux in red, toroidal flux in blue. The other way of doing it is a little bit more complicated. So let's say you have a field line that's oblique, uh, so it has uh, um, or a little oblique flux tube, I should say, uh, very localized, and you figure out what the toroidal field in that plane is corresponding to it. And it's sort of like a, a um, dipole field. And um, what the T tells you is if I had another field line, another little flux tube at one or at position one or position two, um, how much is that yellow flux tube moving, winding around the, the flux tube that you've positioned at point one or point two? So it's um, T tells you the, the scalar T I, I've drawn as a color um, going from positive is in blue and, and negative is in, in, in brown. And LT, the, the actual field, is on the right hand side. So that's the idea of toroidal poloidal. Um, wait. Um, just another aside, once you're doing helicity and spherical volumes, 
there's a funny sort of thing which, which uh, I just wanted to show. If you're doing between two concentric spheres, the self felicity, the twist plus writhe, and the mutual linking between the two are not easy to separate. So the blue string might be writhed a little bit, but it might be twisted a bit, same with the red. They also have some mutual linking due to the winding, uh, or I should have said mutual line, winding. But the thing is, um, so, so between parallel planes, each would be separately conserved, right? Um, sometimes the, if you distort things, the best you can do is get turned, twist into writhe or vice versa, but you're not gonna change the winding if, if the boundary um, foot points are fixed. But look at this, if I just move a field line around the sphere, suddenly it looks like the, this winding is, has changed. And, but of course the total helicity hasn't been affected. You, you post deformation, you get um, a twist associated with it. So it's just sort of a caveat that, that some of the things in spherical geometries don't work quite the way they do in, in parallel plane geometries. Um, now, getting back to the poetal toroidal, um, what I want to do is generate this poetal toroidal decomposition to some arbitrary, simply connected surfaces. Okay, so um, maybe the most useful one for numerics would be a cube, since it's quite popular to do numerics in a cube. Um, it's also useful to do in a half sphere, because after all, um, the, the, uh, if you take the helicity of the entire sun, let's say, or the entire earth, it would be almost zero but um, you might get negative in the, sorry, yeah, negative in the north and positive in the south. And, and so you'd be interested in cutting things in half. So um, you might want half spheres or, or whatever geometry you like. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, one way of doing it, which, uh, worked on with Gunnar Hornig, is that the fields B poloidal and B toroidal are determined by the boundary data Bn or Jn. So um, I'll define the normal component of the curl as a sort of curly D. And um, now we want to invert it. That's not unique, but we can make it unique by saying it's the inverse curl is a divergence-free vector field parallel to the surface. So we're taking, uh, making a choice, in effect, a choice of gauge for that inverse operator. Um, okay, and you can prove it's unique by all that Laplacian stuff. Um, and you can write, so B toroidal is, is D inverse Jn, B poloidal is curl of D inverse Bn. Um, okay. Now I'm gonna let W be a radial component labeling nested surfaces. Again, the poloidal field will contain all the normal flux, and the toroidal flux, all the normal current. Um, I, but, what I have before, I, I, um, this works when we have a sphere, but something weird happens when it's not that symmetric. So I'm going to define the toroidal field as before. That takes care of, of all electric current, but with the poloidal field, I'll just say, this is everything else. Um, B minus B toroidal and B, and it, it does contain all the BNs and JN equals zero. But something weird happens. It's just not behaving properly. The obvious vector potential 
d inverse bn doesn't quite give you this poloidal field. It gives an unwanted field parallel to the surface. And that gives you a spurious extra perpendicular current. That's when it's not a sphere or, or a plane. So we need to add a correction term, a new toroidal field. Okay, and I'll call this the shape field. And you just subtract off the, it, when you subtract it, you get rid of the same undesired perpendicular current. Um, part of the poloidal field is this weird sort of shape field thing. And um, so it's only non-zero if the curvature is not constant. And the helicity can still be defined as the linking of poloidal with toroidal fields. But now there's an extra linking of the poloidal field with the shape field. And weirdly, when you do all the algebra, you don't get that factor of two that you get the um, usual a poloidal dot b toroidal. You just get a single one. So there is a way of doing helicity um, one surface at a time with these um, uh, non-symmetric, simply connected objects. Okay, so um, with the, if you did have spherical symmetry, you get the same as relative helicity. You don't get the same if you uh, have a funny shaped object. There's some interest there in, in seeing what the difference is. Um, now, I'll go on and go to the sort of last part of the talk and um, say something just a little bit rude about Fourier spectra. Um, so Fourier spectra is another way of sort of decomposing fields and, and objects into different contributions from different places or different scales mostly. Um, so you just Fourier transform the magnetic field, um, then A of K would be minus I K cross B over K squared. Um, and you get a Fourier spectra, you're not Fourier transforming A dot B, you're Fourier transforming A separately to B. When you get H of K, it's gauge invariant. And it's a uh, great use in turbulence theory, if anything, dynamo theory, anywhere where you're using uh, magnetic helicity or even just magnetic energy in, in turbulence. And, um, Okay, but there's this weird sort of counterexample. I think it's an open question of whether this is completely sort of artificial or whether it's telling you something. But I'm going to create a field with parallel flux tubes, and an array of parallel flux tubes, and they're oppositely twisted. And if you figure out the, if when you Fourier transform this, you get zero. The helicity spectrum will be identically zero. And that's because at the sort of length scale or wave number of interest, you know, sort of like the corresponding to the diameter of these flex tubes, half of them are positively twisted, half of them are negatively twisted. It, sums to zero. Okay, so there's a way of hiding the helicity from Monsieur Fourier. Um, uh, Fourier doesn't see these local things. So I think it's a bit of an open question. How much is helicity hiding in, um, say, you know, if you have some data from, from some dynamo code, um, is there any helicity sort of hiding away in uh, positive and negative things at the same wave number? So that's a question that, that, that might be addressable. Okay. And one possible way of addressing that is with wavelets. So let's see. 
um, you're only getting biases towards positive and negative helicity at different length scales. Another thing, I don't know if this is that important, but if you have discrete structures like isolated flux tubes, um, whenever you Fourier transform something very narrow, you get a wide spectrum, you get a lot of wiggles there. So that um, goes into, into your Fourier spectrum as, as well. Um, so that might be an advantage of Fourier, it's seeing the discreteness of, of your uh, magnetic field. Okay, so I mentioned wavelets, and this is work mostly due to Chris Pryor and uh, my research student Gareth Hawks, who, who is now Dr. Hawks, um, and who has been grabbed by the biology people um, doing epidemiology. Um, but the idea between wavelet analysis is, is that you um, have, you, you try to have loc essentially localized spectra. So you, you do both scale and uh, locality at the same time. Um, so let's see how that works briefly. Um, you can have, I'll do these with Haar wavelets, but there are other kinds of wavelets that have nice desirable properties like Deboshi's uh, wavelet um, and others that, um, but the Haar wavelet is in some ways the simplest um, because it, it just uses sort of square waves. And you have a scaling function phi, which goes to zero. The recording is on. Um, outside the region of interest and one inside the region of interest. Um, and that's what we'll call the father wavelet. And inside there, there there's some sort of wiggly wavelet, uh, which is the mother wavelet. And what we're going to do is these, these are our basis functions, just like sines and cosines. And they have various scales. Um, so um, S will refer to scale, L will refer to locality, and the scales um, get divided by factors of two each time. Um, so you can write your uh, a function phi plus size, so the phi uh, of S, phi sub SL tells you where you are, um, what locality and what scale, and then you might add uh, one of these size to give you a, a little wiggle just to give you a, a bit more information when you're doing transforms. And um, you can transform just like you do Fourier transforms. There might be a constant term plus a sum over the scales and the localities. Okay. Um, it starts getting messy when you go to three dimensions. So in terms of locality, we'll want little cubes all with the same scale S, but you'll have three different localities, L, M, and N, in the three directions. And since the whole thing was phi plus, plus psi in each direction, um, you get eight combinations of phi and psi. Um, so you have to keep track of all of these different sort of uh, wavelet, uh, basis wavelets. Um, so it's a bit of messy to keep track of everything. Um, so we'll just call them mu for all these different variations. Um, anyhow, um, and you write your function as uh, a transform um, using one of these wave functions, scale S localities L, M, N, and mu tells you sort of how much of the father wavelets you're using, how much of the mother. Um, so you get all this messy sum stuff. Okay. Um, so 
I'm also to show you some pictures because it, it just gets all the algebra gets pretty messy, but we um, sum over the di directionality, simplify the notation, and get this sum. Um, so for helicit magnetic helicity, I'm going to use the winding gauge in two dimensions. I'm calling it C of X here, the, the, the vector potential and winding gauge. And we transform that and transform the B, and that gives you uh, a sum over uh, helices that are at a particular scale and a particular locality. Um, so um, just haven't done too much with this, but we'll, I'll show you a few pictures just to finish off the talk. Um, for linked flux rings, um, so what I am showing on the right here is a sort of cumulative plot going from left on large scales to the right on small scales. And if the, um, if it's untwisted, you get the, um, sorry, the, the, the red thing. So, so most of the helicity is at large scales. The, if on the blue you have, um, where you have twisted flux soups, you get more helicity due to the twist at smaller scales. Um, it, uh, you have to go to smaller scales to get all of the helicity. Um, and um, on the bottom left is a sort of picture uh, where the strength of the, the dot um, tells you sort of how much helicity is um, at that particular place um, in, in the region. So um, it, it sort of tracks where the, where this, the tubes are. So um, you can also do a field line helicity where you take one field line shown here in red and see to sum over how much flux it's winding around. And um, I'll give you, instead of the simple flux tubes, uh, we did a little bit with the Dundee braided field, which starts out as a messy braided field and then reconnects to form two simple um, parallel flux tubes. Um, what so the left hand field, the left hand diagram shows the messy magnetic field lines, and I one magnetic field line is distinguished by being shown in green. And if you add up all the windings of all the other field lines, that's the field line helicity, and that would be one dot on the diagram on the right. Um, can't really tell you which dot, sorry about that. But if you looked at, um, take any field line, it corresponds to some dot on this. This is sort of the XY plane. And um, you get different field line Let's see some positive in blue and some red, negative in red, and so on. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is wavelet transform the field line helicities. Initially, this is a messy braided field, which after as time goes along, reconnects to form two nice um, in parallel tubes. And this is the XY plane at the bottom. And what, so um, this is just showing where the field directions are in that XY plane. Um, now as from T equals zero to T equals not 0.9. When you look at the field line helicities, you can look, as you go from left to right, you go in time and things simplify. Field line helicities um, uh, become very simplified on all scales. Um, 
but you can actually separate different scales and see that um, on the highest, largest scale, um, well, things simplify. Um, most of the field line helicity really is in the center where, where there's still a lot of twist. Um, but on smaller scales, you get a lot of structure um, outside of, of those points. And some of the structure is negative helicity and some of it is positive. So sometimes different scales will have at different scales, but the same locality, you will get uh, positive or negative helicities. So there's a whole host of an analyses you can do with separating both scales and locality using the wavelet transform. Um, the hope is that, that, that this can add to our understanding both of reconnection, which is what we're doing here, and also a bit maybe in turbulence theory, where maybe there are some hidden twists, hidden helicities that the Fourier transform isn't finding. Okay, so I'll stop right there. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Mitch. Thank you for your talk. And uh, I, I guess uh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, let me let me just uh, put you one uh, that is uh, reminiscent uh, of old times, so to speak. And probably you answered these questions many times, but maybe a, an update on that. So you mentioned the uh, high order linking numbers, yes. and uh, um, but I I somehow forget if there is any connection uh, apart from high order helicities that you may mm -hmm. you may say something about. But uh, uh, with energy, for example, uh, I oh. don't think there, there works. Uh, uh, putting in relation uh, these uh, two two contexts. It's I've been seen a period, a, it, yeah. a period when a lot of work, or at, at least uh, certainly partly due to you and collaborators focusing on ways to grab uh, topological information of these uh, of these particular systems mm -hmm. like Burmian rings, etc. But then mm -hmm. uh, I do not recall any attempt to relate uh, this information to energy, for instance. Can you comment yeah, on that? That's a good question. Um, I mean, you can, let's say, you take a braid or, or a knot diagram, um, and instead of having positive and negative crossings, make them all positive. Um, and that's sort of corresponding to putting modulus or absolute value signs inside your integral of b dot r cross b prime and you get a sort of um crossing number indeed uh, integral over crossing numbers and you can relate you can get a lower bound on energy given the total crossing number of, of the field mm. um, so that's where everything is positive all the crossings are are considered positive so in a sense, that would extend the uh, the bounds that we have, uh, uh, let's say more more um, you know standard bounds between between uh, uh, helicity and uh, say cro topological crossing number. Yes, uh, that's right. But doing okay. yeah, doing the higher order, I'm not sure um, uh, what bounds you can get. Okay. Questions, please. Yeah. Can I ask uh, a sure. question? Uh, the uh, you showed the braid for the Borromean ring, uh, Mitch, mm -hmm. and um, I wondered your your dh by dz there, or dz yeah. if you like. Um, that's presumably non-zero at each uh, level, is it? Um, no, it will wiggle. Um, let's see. Uh, where is it here? 
Yeah, I mean, so at, the integral must be zero. The integral must be zero, but it as you go around, you um, probably the I would guess DHDZ goes up and down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I see. So at any given fixed level, it yeah. will be um, it will be non-zero. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Which is that is kind of interesting. Is is that somehow, in any sense, invariant for the Borromean ring? Um, if you fix the three ends, I guess it would be invariant. Recording. One, yeah. <laughs> one thing you could do, I suppose, is give a uniform twist at each level to kill any helicity that you've obtained. So you probably uh, right. yeah. could yeah. have ordinary helicity zero at each level. Yeah. Probably could yeah. do that. So, um, so it's not invariant, in other words. It's, uh, it's, the it's only the integral that is integral invariant. Integral, that is. Yeah. But, but, but there will be a special braid that has h of z zero at each point. You could you could draw that I think. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, well, that would be the unbraid, wouldn't it? Yeah, or... almost the unbra unbraid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> A very nice talk, though. I enjoyed that. Uh, very interesting Thanks. ideas. Lovely. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, Axel. Long. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether... I can't hear you. I can't hear you either. I, I... I heard a little. Um, still, we can't hear. Dasha. Yes, it is. Let's see. Uh, pull it down a little. I... We can't see what you wrote. I think it says. He says to look at the chat. Ah, oh. look at the chat, correct. Oh, I see. Is there realizability condition with wavelets? Oh, here's chat. Not actually ask it. Uh, I believe it's okay with these multi-resolution analysis. Um, so, oh, realizability. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure that that. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not, <laughs> not entirely sure with that. I couldn't hear the question. Yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. Is, Question was, is there a realizability condition with wavelets? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, Good question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a related <laughs> question. Can you hear me, Mitch? Yes, yes. I was wondering, like you said, for the Fourier transform, it was automatically gauge invariant by, by the way yeah. you defined it. Is yeah. it also true for the wavelet transform? Um, okay, so what, yes, what, I mean, um, yes and no, it, it is in the sense that we're transforming, in effect, this weird sort of two-point correlation function between the, I can draw it, the field at one place and the field in another place. So you're taking two vectors and saying, how much are those vectors trying to wind around each other? You don't want them to be parallel, they're not winding. You don't want to be pointing towards each other, not winding. So in effect, you're transforming that special. So it is a special gauge, but it is a meaningful gauge. But uh, it's not as, not like the, the Fourier in, in that sense. Where, where so you just, have you used it in a dynamo simulation, no, for example? No, I'd be very eager to see, see what, I think Axel should be the right person to 
look at yeah. that yeah. and see whether you can distinguish small <laughs> scales and the large scale yeah. Uh, yeah. helicities. That's right. Very interesting. Just, is there some small scale helicity of that's both positive and negative that's somehow hiding from Ms. Monsieur Fourier that actually has some consequence, some you know, some dynamical well, effects. I, I think in a paper with Axel, we split it in polarization, positive uh -huh. and negative. Ah, and right. it's kind of zero uh, in in the majority of case space, but it can stick out at small k, one polarization yeah. over the other. Right. So that was one way which we are trying to distinguish the two uh, signs. But wavelets could be another thing which one could try. Yes. Very interesting. Yes, nice. <laughs> May I ask a question? Yes. Sure, go uh, ahead. This is Matthias. Uh, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, actually two. So uh, the first thing, you pr presented this generalized colloidal toroidal decomposition for other than spherical or plane yeah. uh, surfaces. I yeah. suppose you can confirm that in this case, um, the property Curl B poloidal is a toroidal field, and curl uh, toroidal field is a poloidal field. It's not preserved, right? Not preserved, no. no. Oh, okay. Yeah, you get, you get these extra shape fields that... Yeah, that's yeah. Because this property uh, has been shown to be uh, present only for spheres or planes. That's right. Yeah, no, okay. that's right. yeah. And the other thing, um, <clears throat> I was puzzled by your example where the uh, H of K so the helicity spectrum is zero, although there is a local helicity density. But uh, isn't that so that you can only expect to see something in H of k if the volume integral of the of the helicity density is not zero? Because H of k is so equal to a uh, asterisk of k times b of k is yeah. only telling uh, which contributions are made from the individual case into the volume integral. So if the volume integral is zero, like in your example, then it's not a surprise that H of K yes. is also zero. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay, good. Then uh, I've got it right. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. It's so just the, a question. The, 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 I mean, it's an artificial example, but mm -hmm. let's say you have something real that has felicity, in other words, net positive helicity at scale 5 and ne negative helicity at scale 25 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is some of this stuff, oh wait, here it is, <laughs> uh, is some of this stuff hiding in there somewhere? You don't, you might not realize it. I mean, um, because you say they would cancel. Because they cancel, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if you see if you see that, uh, if you instead uh, of doing the Fourier analysis, do the wavelet analysis, is yeah. is it then true that the wavelet result, the wavelet spectrum of the helicity, is not making a statement about the volume integral of the helicity? Mm, no, no. Is that true? It's, um, no, it's really looking more locally. Uh -huh. Okay, so from the way from the result of the wavelet analysis, I would not be able to form a statement about the volume integral, or would I? Uh, I think you would if if you just looked at all the wavelets and added them uh -huh. all. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good. Other questions. Well, that um, example you just uh, had assured us um, it has uh, zero helicity spectrum. That's that was new to me. I think that's fascinating and yeah. quite surprising, really. You mm -hmm. you would somehow expect um, that to give non-zero helicity H of K at the yeah. scale of an individual tube. And it's very surprising that it doesn't. It's, I suppose, because helicity can be positive or negative. Energy spectrum would never do that. Uh, yes. Yeah, I see it. That's the problem, isn't it? Mm. Oh, it's really puzzling and interesting. Yeah. <laughs>
Do you have many other examples of that kind, or you've just managed to create that one? Just created that one, yeah. That, that's why I'm a little worried it's too artificial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One wonders how sort of generic it might be, how gen what the most general situation might be. And I, I mean, the answer may not be so much, maybe may rather than the way, but somehow getting absolute, putting some absolute values in somewhere, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, okay. Thank you very much, Mitch. Very That's interesting yes. talk and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you for coming.